Thank you. How is everyone? Yay! There's less people here today than the last two days, I think. Some monster is devouring smart DevCon attendees one by one. I'm afraid. Um, so yeah, my name is Jonathan, and I work at a company called Sauce Labs. And we do um, automated testing in the cloud. So I'm going to talk a little bit about automated testing. So if you aren't aware of that, then you'll learn a little bit today. And uh, one of the things that we're really interested in is automated testing for mobile apps, because that's a new area that not a lot of people have taken advantage of yet. So Appium, I'll uh, tell you more about it in a minute, but it's an open source tool for mobile automation. And I've had the privilege of being able to work a lot on this tool this year um, and build up a really great community. So I hope you'll enjoy the presentation and uh, join the Appium community for testing your own apps. So a little bit of an introduction. Um, we hear things like mobile is taking over the world a lot. And um, it's true. Uh, this conference, I think, is one of is a testament to that fact. This conference is about smart devices, not just mobile, but I think the trend is true and real that smart devices, smartphones are more ubiquitous. Um, they're everywhere. And it's a little different than what we're used to with the web, with desktop computing. And so making sure that our apps running on these smart devices work well is also going to be different than the way that we do that for desktop apps or web apps. So it's a really important question. How do we make sure that our mobile apps that we're writing or our smart device apps that we're writing um, are at a high level of quality all the time? I think everyone agrees that having a high quality app is important. If you put a low quality app onto the App Store, or if you have some kind of bug, then all the users who are using that app will give it one star, and you'll probably lose lots of money. And it tends to be much harder to change your application once you've published it to a store. You can't just make a fix to the JavaScript file and upload it to your server like we can with the web to fix a syntax error. If your app doesn't work correctly, depending on the platform, Maybe the worst is Apple. It could take weeks before your users can get a bug fix. Meanwhile, you're getting lots of negative reviews. Maybe your business fails. I don't know. It could be really bad. So QA is very important, but at the same time, it's painful. And the way that, that mobile developers tend to do this these days is get as many devices as they can, install the app on the devices, and, and use it manually. Uh, this is unfortunately very time consuming. And it's easy to miss cases uh, that, that someone else using your app might run into, but you're not thinking about. It's also not the kind of thing that you want to do every time you change a line of code, because it's so time consuming. But unfortunately, the more complex our apps become, the higher the risk that we are going to introduce a bug when we don't realize it. The more that our app has different pieces that depend on each other, the more likely it is that when we make some small change to one piece, it actually has a change across the entire system. And if we're not testing every single bit of functionality every time we make a change, it's possible for bugs to creep in. And this is a really bad situation because of all the reasons I just mentioned. So the solution to this is something called automated testing. Um, how many of you are already familiar with automated testing? OK, everybody, great. How many of you actually do automated testing for your apps? Less than half, OK. So um, that's still pretty good. A lot of people haven't done this at all. And in a room full of mobile developers, I would have expected that maybe it's even less. Um, so those of you who have done automated testing already, know the kind of feeling of confidence and power that it gives you. It enables you to have a fast development cycle while maintaining a high level of quality. And for the one or two of you who maybe don't know what automated testing is, it's the practice of writing code to test your apps rather than testing your apps by hand. 
And there are a lot of different ways to write this code so that you can run a suite of tests anytime you make a change. And you can know immediately if something is broken in your application. So the next thing that you can do once you have a bunch of automated tests written is you can make use of something called continuous integration. Now, you probably also have heard of this, yes? Yeah? Some nodding heads, great. Uh, so continuous integration is made possible by automated testing and with the addition of automated deployment. So this has become a very commonplace in the web. So you might have a suite of tests that run when you change some code for your web application. And then you have some kind of server that knows when all of the tests have passed and are successful. And it can automatically, at that point, deploy your code to your production environment. So that you don't have to wait days to deploy new code. You can deploy code whenever all of your tests have passed, or whenever all the tests are green, as most people say. So this makes for a very fast dev cycle, where all you have to worry about is writing code. And then your tests take care of making sure that that code works well. And the continuous integration server takes care of deploying this automatically to your production environment. So this is kind of how I like to visualize um, the best version of the development cycle. I call it the dev cycle of optimal happiness. So um, there's a couple different uh, colors here. They mean different things. The light color on the top and right are things that you as a developer are responsible for. The darker color on the bottom and the left are things that can happen automatically with a continuous integration workflow. So here's how it works. Whenever you want to develop a new feature, it's always a good idea to start with the hypothesis. You're making a claim that, hey, if I build this feature, something will happen. Maybe we'll sell more copies of the application, or maybe some other metric will change. But you have to have some way of, of making a claim that um, when you put this feature into the world, it will change positively for your company or for your application. If you don't have a hypothesis that can be tested, you'll never know if the work you put in is having any effect. So it's always a good idea to start with some kind of idea of, if I build this feature, it's going to impact us positively in these one or three or five ways. So that when you're done, you can measure and see how well you did compared to that hypothesis. Once you know what you're going to do, you can write the code to make this new feature happen. Or if you're a test-driven developer, you can write the test first and then the code. But whichever way you do it, you write your code and you write tests. And you always want to make sure to write tests for each of the new features and each of the new cases in each of those features that you're building. Then you can push that code to uh, your shared repository, like GitHub or something. At that point, everything uh, from there to deployment can be automatic. So your continuous integration server can detect that there has been new code pushed to your shared repository. It can pull down your new code and your new tests, run your new tests, as, as well as all of the old tests for your application. Now, assuming all of those tests pass, your continuous integration server can then automatically deploy the code to your production environment. It can run a series of other tests to make sure that everything actually that you care about in production still works, like you didn't crash the server on accident or something. Um, and then you can automatically gather metrics, which can be reported back to you so that you can evaluate whether your hypothesis was successful. And then you can start the cycle again. Now, of course, what often happens is when you push code and your CI server runs tests is you find that tests fail, which usually means that you have a bug. So then you can go to the middle stage, fix your bugs, check in the new code with the better, the better code or the better tests or whatever, and then the cycle continues. So I put this picture together. Um, with web applications in mind, because that's, that's where you can do this the most easily. 
Unfortunately, it hasn't been as easy to do this in the mobile world because it's not as easy to deploy changes. And it hasn't been that easy to write and run automated tests for mobile applications. So that's where Appium comes in. Appium is a cross-platform tool to help you automate native and hybrid mobile applications. And you can use this automation for testing. So it gives you the piece in the bottom right corner where a continuous integration server can run automated tests. Now, it doesn't give you the rest of it. Um, other people are working on those parts right now. But Appium is one of the pieces that you need to be able to have this really awesome workflow for mobile application development. So as I was saying, it basically makes automated testing and therefore continuous integration possible for mobile in a way that was very difficult before. So that's a little background introduction of what Appium is all about. But why, why does it exist in the first place? What else was out there when we decided to start working on Appium? Why did we feel that we needed this tool specifically? A little under a year ago, when we started working on Appium, this was sort of the landscape for mobile automation. So there were some tools that already existed for mobile automation. But for a variety of reasons, we didn't think that they were suitable for the kind of workflow that we thought would be the best. So um, there were a number of tools for iOS apps and a number of tools for Android apps. Um, but for the most part, there were not any that considered themselves to be cross-platform. So if you, had, uh, if you had an iOS app and you had an Android app, you had to use a completely different language and framework in order to test each of those, even if your app was identical across both platforms. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we felt that we needed Appium. And you can see I have put it in the very middle of the slide to say we're trying to enable you to automate both platforms. And since then, we've expanded to even more platforms including Firefox OS. And as you'll see later, I'm hoping to convince some of you to help me port it to uh, even more platforms that we've heard about during Smart DevCon. So out of curiosity, has anyone used any of these other frameworks? Yeah, which one? Uh, and, uh, Monkey Talk. Monkey Talk, okay. Same for you, yeah. Robotium. Cool, cool. Um, so yeah, so Robotium is, is uh, Android only. And um, anyway, I'll get into some more of the specifics in a little bit. But Appium also has a pretty strict philosophy, I guess you could say, which we could put in the form of four different rules that we felt that any mobile automation framework needs to obey these four rules in order to be uh, the best possible framework for mobile developers to use. So the first rule was that we felt you should test the exact same application that you're submitting to the marketplace. So what this means is that if you have a test framework that forces you to compile in some kind of third party library in order to run the tests, that's bad because you're not actually testing the same application that you're submitting to the store. You're testing a modified version of your application with all of this test harness code inside it as well. And uh, we felt that it would be great if you could test a binary that was the same binary as is being shipped to your users. That way you have a high degree of confidence that if all of your tests are passing on this binary, then it's exactly what your users are going to experience. Secondly, we felt that it was a bad idea to force people who are writing tests to write in one language or one framework. Uh, we think that if you like writing JavaScript or Ruby or Java or PHP or Python or Go or C, you should be able to use that language to write your tests. You shouldn't be forced and locked into using just one language. Similarly, we felt that an automation framework for mobile shouldn't reinvent the wheel. It shouldn't come up with an entirely new uh, model for automation 
there are other successful models for UI automation, and we felt it was important to use the one that is already the most standard. And I'll talk about what that is in a moment. And lastly, we felt that it should be open source. It shouldn't be owned by any company or any individual. Um, it should be owned by the community, and everything about it should be done completely in the open. Um, and this was not the case with some of the other projects that we were looking at. So from the very beginning of Appium, uh, every, every commit has gone through a pull request and review process, and um, all of the issues have been handled on the public forums and the GitHub issue tracker and so on. And so it's very important to us that this is an, a true open source thing. So Sauce Labs does not own it. I do not own it. Um, it, is, it is open source in every sense of the word. So then taking the frameworks that we saw earlier, when we evaluated them to see if they met these four rules, um, it looks like they really didn't. And so that's why we felt that it was a good idea to put some effort into building something that did meet all four of these rules. Now, you know, maybe it's not a bad thing for some of these other frameworks to not meet these rules. Maybe that's not what they're trying to do. But we felt it was important to have something that did try an attempt to fit this philosophy. So enough about what Appium is and why it exists. Uh, I have a little video of a demo I put together. Um, and what this demo is, is a cross-platform test. So it's uh, a test written in, I actually think I wrote it in JavaScript, but it's one series of commands that are run first on an Android device and then on an iOS device uh, with an app that's been developed for both platforms. So it's the exact same test code, and it'll run once on Android and then once on iOS. So you can see um, the, the proof of Appium's cross-platform compatibility. So uh, on the bottom of the uh, terminal window is the Appium server. And so you can see it starting up and, and starting to talk to the Android device. And the top window, I'm just uh, using a test runner to kick off the tests. Um, now, the application that we're testing is a photo app called Woven that takes your photos from Facebook and Flickr and lets you view them in different ways. And so right now, the test code has found different UI elements and interacted with them, enabled us to log in, performed various swipes, uh, found a picture to inspect, um, waited for the UI to fade away, come back in. Uh, we, can, we can move left and right and up and down using a variety of touch gestures. And we found the settings for my account. And that's where uh, this test ends. So now we're going to run the same code. Um, I've alt-tabbed alt over to the uh, iPhone simulator. And it's doing the exact same steps, um, except this time for the iOS version of the application. And you get to see some pictures that I took on a vacation a long time ago. I think they're pretty. Has anyone been to Guatemala? It's a nice place. They have volcanoes there. Probably no volcanoes in Poland. <laughs> That's good, safe, very safe here. Um, yeah, so and then the iOS uh, version of the app has a logout button so we can click it to log out and, and finish this version of the test. So that's what Appium can do. So that's what it does um, and let's talk a little bit about how it does it. First of all, um, this is what Appium currently supports. Um, we support testing on real devices, on simulators and emulators. Uh, we support testing hybrid apps, so apps that uh, have a thin native layer with some kind of web view component to them. So we enable you to test uh, both the native portion of the application as well as the, the website or web application that's inside of the web view. And we enable you to test mobile web. So if you just want to use Safari or Chrome, 
uh, to test a web application on a mobile device, you can do that with Appium as well. And there's also uh, robot support so that you can uh, have physical touch gestures if you want, which is obviously very experimental at this point. So Appium is basically a simple web server um, that creates and handles WebDriver sessions. Um, has anyone heard of, of WebDriver? One or two people? How about Selenium? Has anyone heard of Selenium? More people? So we WebDriver is the, the new name for the Selenium project. Um, it's the, the newer version of Selenium that has a, a much better API. So when you write Appium test code, you're actually just writing WebDriver test code. So if you've ever written a Selenium test or a WebDriver test for the web, it's exactly the same. So as I was saying, the Selenium WebDriver is an HTTP protocol. So you, you uh, send commands to the server using uh, you know, typical uh, HTTP verbs and URLs. And what that does is makes it possible to automate uh, these applications in any language because every language has uh, you, um, some kind of HTTP library that you can use to talk to a server. So every language has a client it, for Selenium WebDriver that lets you write in your native code uh, the commands that you want to send to the device to automate. WebDriver is also currently the standard for browser automation. So if you do, uh, if you use open source tools to automate web applications, you're using WebDriver these days. And uh, more than that, it's actually a, uh, a W3C specification at this point. It's a draft specification. So it's been proposed by a lot of companies, including uh, Mozilla and um, I think Microsoft is even on board. There is a huge working group that is making this a standard for the web so that the browsers themselves are going to support this uh, HTTP protocol for automation. And what we're doing is we're extending this protocol for mobile so that no matter what kind of device you're testing, you're using the same kind of protocol across all platforms. And I already made the point that um, given the client server architecture, uh, you can have uh, a web driver or an Appium test written in pretty much every language. There are a few that don't have implementations written yet, but um, every language that people use day to day already has an implementation of the web driver protocol. And again, I already mentioned that um, web driver is a W3C working draft. So that's the interface. That's how you uh, define the types of things that you want to test. But how does Appium, once it receives these commands, how does it actually turn them into behaviors on your mobile device? Well, that depends on the platform. Because at this point, every platform has exposed a different method for automating devices for that platform. So Apple has given us something called Instruments, uh, which is a little app that uh, will take a bunch of JavaScript and will run it on a device. And this JavaScript makes use of something called the UI Automation API. And that lets us perform different kinds of automation. Um, similarly, Google has given us tools for automating Android devices. Um, their tool is called UI Automator. Um, it's uh, you basically you write a Java uh, binary and you ship it over to your device and then you can run a test case with that with access to this UI Automator API. And that's for newer Android devices. For older Android devices, we use the instrumentation framework to uh, get access to UI elements and interact with them in an application. And Firefox OS has actually already implemented um, a web driver based automation protocol in the form of Marionette. So more than any of the other vendors that Appium supports, uh, Firefox OS was the easiest to implement support for. In fact, I did it in about an hour uh, when I was meeting with some of the people who made Marionette. 
and I just learned yesterday about uh, Ubuntu touches um, automation support. So you know, whenever Appium has support for Ubuntu Touch, that will then go on the list here as the way that uh, automation is made possible for that platform. So this isn't very important to, uh, to know if you just want to learn how to use Appium. But if you're interested in how Appium works, this is kind of um, an architectural diagram of how we make use of what Apple provides uh, in terms of automation. So um, on the left, we have our WebDriver script. This is what you are responsible for writing. So this is some kind of script in that makes use of the WebDriver protocol to send commands to the Appium server. And the Appium server takes those commands, um, turns them into the appropriate uh, UI automation API commands, um, ships some JavaScript over to uh, the iOS device where it's executed, and we can get results and information back. So everything inside of that box on the right-hand side is what Appium takes care of for you so that you don't have to learn um, the specifics of Apple's API. You don't have to set up any kind of infrastructure around managing these tests and so on, you just maintain a suite of web driver tests that hit Appium server and that's how you automate an iOS device. And it's basically the same with Android. Um, so it's a little bit of a nicer picture because uh, the tooling on Android um, makes it a little more simple to send automation commands back and forth to something running on the device. But the point is that on the left-hand side, your script could be more or less exactly the same for both, for both platforms. So that's Appium in general. Um, one of the great things about Appium, I think, is that the community has already produced some really nice uh, tools to make using Appium even easier. So there's actually a graphical user interface for Appium called appium.app, and there's, there's also uh, one for Windows. Um, if you guys like Windows more. And appium.app is um, a simple GUI for, for launching Appium. It lets you monitor the status of the server and set different preferences and server flags without having to uh, know all of the flags you can pass through the command line. So it looks kind of like this. Um, so you can pick the app that you want to automate, add some different information about it and click launch and that will start the Appium server listening for incoming connections to run tests. And we have a preferences window so you can tweak Appium's behavior in all the different ways that are possible. And uh, the best part is that it comes with an inspector for uh, probing your application. So it, en it enables you to um, find ways to retrieve UI elements in your app so you can interact with them. It enables you to try out different kinds of automation in a point and click fashion. It lets you record uh, those actions so that you can play them back later. And it has a little code exporter so that you can um, copy and paste your, your playback code into a test script in pretty much any language. So it looks kind of like this. Um, the big window, the big main window is basically a, a hierarchy viewer, so you can um, navigate your application's UI hierarchy that way, and you see a little uh, red highlighting on, um, on the screenshot there to, to tell you what you're looking at. And in the bottom right, you get all the kind of metadata about the particular element that you're introspecting. Um, it gives you things like um, the name or the label of the element, also a kind of XPath locator, which you can use in your tests to find that particular element and interact with it in an automated way. And then this is just what it looks like if you want to um, try out a few automation behaviors and then take the code that that generates and copy it into your own um, test suite somehow. OK. So how do we actually write Appium tests? What does that look like? If you have your text editor and you're, you have your app and you want to start writing a test for your app, how do you do that? Well, first we need to understand 
the model. And as I said, uh, the Appium test model is the same as the WebDriver test model. It's the same protocol. So if you've used WebDriver, you know that it's centered around the idea of a session. So you first start a session, and that will instantiate your application and give you the ability to find elements in your application and interact with them, and then introspect your application to make sure that your test conditions are satisfied. And then when you're done, you stop the session so that the server knows that you're done with your test. And then you can have another session for another test, or however you choose to architect it. So this is just a bit of Python code. Um, this could be in, in any language. Um, but what we're doing here, basically, is uh, creating a string, which is the location of the Appium server. In this case, it's just running on my local computer on its default port. And we're um, creating a desired capabilities object. Now, desired capabilities are a set of uh, things that we want to tell the server so that we automate what we want to automate. In this case, uh, we're setting the device desired capability to iPhone simulator, which means that we want to run this test on iPhone instead of, say, Android or Firefox OS. And then the only other thing we need for iOS is the absolute path to the application on our computer. So whatever we, we, we create a debug build in Xcode and it creates a .app directory, uh, we just pass that straight to Appium and Appium will take care of launching that in the simulator and running your test. So the final line in our setup function is uh, what gives us an instance of the WebDriver object in Python. And that's what enables us to then start running automation commands. And our, our teardown function, which is run after each test, just quits the session. It cleans everything out so that our next test will run with a fresh session and a fresh instance of the application. So the first thing you usually want to do when writing a test is find an element that you want to interact with because you probably want to click a button or enter some text into a field and then click a button and then assert that that text shows up in the right place. Um, those are the kinds of things that applications generally do and so that's what we want to test for. So there's a few different ways to find elements with Appium. We can find elements by their accessibility label. So for iOS and Android anyway, the accessibility label is um, a string which you can attach to pretty much any UI element, uh, which is normally invisible, but for um, users who are using your application in an accessibility mode, um, these strings might be spoken aloud to them or something like that if maybe they are hard of sight. So, um, the UI automation frameworks give us access to these accessibility labels. So if we have labeled our elements well, we can find them in one go just by providing the accessibility label that we attach. And this also enables us to have apps which are uh, easy to automate across multiple platforms. Because if we set the same accessibility identifiers on our iOS app as on our Android app, then we can use the exact same code to find the appropriate element in both applications. We can also find elements by their UI type, right? So um, we have things like buttons and text fields and list views and different kinds of layouts for Android and so on. So we can find elements by that. So we can get a whole list of all the buttons in the view and then cycle through them and click each one or whatever it is that we might want to do. We can also use a more generalized hierarchical type of uh, query to find elements. And so we do this by uh, actually using XPath syntax. So in this example, we could find the button that has the text of, of hi on it. Um, or we could find the button that has uh, a substring of some other kind of text. So this can be really useful if we're trying to find a UI element uh, that has some kind of user-generated data associated with it that we might not know what it is beforehand. The name of the button could be uh, you know, somebody's name in your contact application, and we might want to find that. And so this is a good way to build up that kind of thing. 
And finally, on Android, we can uh, find things by uh, their ID from the, uh, the strings.xml files. So then once we've got elements and they come back to us in our um, frameworks as an object, we can, we can call methods on these element objects. So we can call things like uh, dot .text in Python, and that will give me whatever text is on the button. This is useful for making assertions so that I can get an element and assert something about one of its properties, like its text or its value or its position, something like that. Um, one of the things you always do with a button is click it. So it's really easy to just call click on an element. So this is an example of um, part of the test that I showed you in the video. This is the sign-in portion of the test. So basically, I'm finding uh, the element which has the sign-in accessibility label on it, uh, which is a button. So we click it. And then we're finding the email field by uh, a hard-coded XPath selector. And we're sending a series of keystrokes to that field, which contain my username. Um, and then we're finding the password field. And we're sending keystrokes to that field, too, containing my password. And then the, uh, the new line there is just a kind of shortcut for hitting the, the Go button uh, on the keyboard. So this triggers a login. So you can see that it's a really uh, clean way of, of describing the kind of behavior that you want to do. So you can think like a user. Um, and then write in code the behavior that a user would take in exercising your application. And then this is just the same thing um, in Java, just to kind of prove that you can do this in, in any language. And there's the actual uh, login logic for Java. OK, so that's how you write Appium tests. Um, now I just want to wrap up with a few uh, more demos about Appium's other capabilities. Um, so as I said, we can run it on real devices. And while I was sitting over here in between talks earlier, I took a video of a test running on uh, Nexus 7 that I had with me. So this was the test. This is in, in Node, Node.js, so yet another language. Um, and we can see how, for Android, the desired capabilities look a little different, because I have to know the package uh, identifier for my application and the particular activity that I want to start. And then I have some helper functions that let me find buttons and uh, texts with certain uh, properties. So then this is the actual logic of the test that I'm going to show you. Um, basically, we're automating the context application, or I think it's called people, maybe, on Android. Um, so we're, we're doing a little boilerplate, and then we're clicking the create new uh, contact button, entering in some details about that uh, new contact, saving it, adding it to favorites, which is the little star button. Um, we're editing the contact we just added. We're changing the the uh, category of number of, for the phone number, um, going back to the home. And ultimately, we're deleting the contact again to kind of clear out the state of the application. So you can see it's, it's fairly easy to see what's going on just by looking at the code. So it might be a little small. I just took this with my phone. So we've clicked the Create button. And now we're going to start entering in details, so the name and the hard-coded phone number and whatnot, email address. And we delete things and clear it out, and there we are. So uh, Appium works pretty well on real devices. So a word about uh, scaling up uh, mobile automated testing infrastructure. So what I've been showing you so far is what you can do uh, for local test development or running a few tests at a time, that kind of thing. 
But if you take this dev cycle of optimal happiness to its limit, you're going to end up with hundreds or maybe even thousands of tests for your different applications. And you're going to run into a problem of how you scale uh, your test infrastructure. Um, there, are, there are various limitations. Uh, one of the biggest limitations is that you can only run one um, iOS simulator or uh, one iOS device at a time per Mac. So if you wanted to run 100 different iOS tests at a time, you'd have to figure out some way of having 100 different instances of, of the Mac operating system, which is obviously very expensive because of licensing and hardware and, and all of their kind of restrictive uh, business decisions that they've made. Um, with Android, it's a little nicer, but you're eventually going to run into hardware issues. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that um, if you get into the point where you're really trying to scale your, your test infrastructure, uh, you might need a little help. And that's where the company that I work for um, is, is trying to be helpful to the mobile automation community. Um, so basically, we have a, a bunch of uh, simulators, emulators, and very soon we'll have a bunch of real devices so that you can write your test code and have it run in our cloud rather than having it run locally. So that all you have to do is worry about your test logic and maintaining your test suite. You don't have to worry about any of the infrastructure, uh, setting up Appium, getting all the SDKs working, making sure that versions for everything are correct, handling upgrades, all that kind of stuff. So um, if you want to learn more about that, uh, go to saucelabs.com slash Appium. Um, I think we might have changed this URL to saucelabs.com slash mobile. So, uh, it probably redirects, but in case it doesn't, that's where you go. And um, it's very, very easy to run tests on Sauce that you already have running locally. Basically, the only difference is that you change the location of the Appium server from uh, a URL that probably designates a local host-based server to a URL that designates a location in our cloud. And you have to give us your username and password so we know um, whose account is trying to run tests. But other than that, your test stays exactly the same. So it's very easy to start developing Appium locally. And then the point at which you need to uh, get a little extra scalability or bandwidth, you can then run things on Sauce. And finally, um, I just wanted to give another little demo of uh, how you can test regular web applications using the mobile web browsers like Safari and Chrome. So this is a test um, that basically runs a, a very short test on Safari and then on Chrome. And again, it's the same test code. And it's just regular Selenium WebDriver code. There's nothing different about using Appium. So we're basically just typing something into a box, saving it, and asserting that's there. So it works on Safari on iOS and Chrome on, on Android. And those are the different um, web driver commands that were executed during that test. And then finally, I mentioned something about robots earlier, about physically automating uh, mobile devices. And that's something that um, different people in the Appium community have been working on. And um, it's not really usable yet, but uh, there's been some pretty cool demos that people have done, including this one, which is um, this thing called a Tapster bot, which is a Delta robot that has a spot for an iPhone. And it's uh, automating the keyboard and sending a tweet. So um, that was done using Appium. So Appium knows where the keys are. And it tells the robot software the uh, XY coordinates of different locations on the screen. And the robot software knows how to, to turn that into the correct uh, motions of the stylus so that it can actually tap those locations on the screen. And as you can see, it was fairly accurate. It was able to pick out individual uh, keys on the keyboard, which are fairly small. So um, if you want to go really crazy with automation or you feel like it's very important to test the actual physical gestures for your applications, um, that kind of thing is possible too. It's going to take some more work to, to be generally usable, but um, it's coming. So lastly, um, 
I wanted to just say that the Appium community is always looking for help in different ways. Um, we have lots of, lots of things that we're working on in a lot of different languages. Appium itself is written in Node.js, so if you like that or if you've wanted to learn more about that, um, it's a pretty big and fun project with a lot of interesting bits. Um, we have the, the GUIs that I showed you before, one for Mac and one for Windows, and those are written in Objective-C and, and .NET, uh, respectively. And there's also bits of, of Java uh, thrown in there for Android support. And um, you know, if you thought the robot was cool, uh, the people who run that are always looking for, for people to help make that software better. And then uh, I've been really excited about Smart DevCon and um, learning about some new operating systems that I didn't even know about and um, learning more about ones that I had heard of. And uh, I would love to see all of these supported with Appium, making use of whatever uh, native automation protocols are supported by these different projects and bringing them together um, into this one uh, mobile automation protocol, making it really easy for uh, somebody who maybe has an app on all these different platforms to write a very succinct series of tests uh, and to run them on all the different platforms. So I think that would be a pretty amazing goal and I'm going to be checking into some of these different operating systems and seeing how feasible it is to, to get support for them in Appium uh, in the coming weeks and months. And then um, for those of you who are sticking around for the hackathon tomorrow, um, I'm not going to be making any mobile apps, but I'll be around um, working on Appium. And if anybody wants to take an app that they're developing and, and see how it works to try and write an automated test for it, I can help you get set up. So come and see me and uh, Bernie tomorrow at the hackathon. OK, so um, that's my talk. And um, if you have questions, I have a few prizes, a couple different kinds of t-shirts, and hot sauce, <laughs> things like that. So um, I'm going to have to come give you the microphone. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, yes. So maybe uh, first will be the easy one. Uh, can I run tests, um, Appium tests, on an emulator that is started in a headless mode? Which kind of emulator? Um, Android emulator, for example. Um, I I didn't know that you could start Android emulators in a headless mode. Well, if your continuous integration server is um, is a machine that doesn't have any um, uh, any other interface that than command line, then Android, uh, then you know uh, it's the only option for uh, um, uh, for starting an emulator. But sorry, I thought it would be an easy one, easy question. Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess it depends on whether the emulator still has the UI layer because uh, Robotium tests uh, <coughs> can pass. Okay, um, I would imagine that it could then. Um, it depends because the technology that we use is called UI Automator and that Google has designed to actually fit inside of the UI layer itself mm -hmm. and so if for whatever reason in headless mode this layer isn't there then it might not work but um, I don't see why it wouldn't right now. Uh, okay and uh, the second question uh, do you plan to add support or maybe you already have support for some uh, gesture-based inter interactions, like uh, if, if you have a um, gesture, uh, um, like drag and drop mechanism in your application, can you test this kind of interaction? Yes, yeah, we support um, most kinds of gestures right now and we'll support the rest soon. Uh, we're limited by what we're given by, say, Apple and Google, but what we're given is pretty good. We can do um, several kinds of multi-touch gestures like the drag, uh, or no, like the, the pinch and zoom ones. Uh, we do have tests for drag and drop for Android. Um, obviously things like swipe and flick mm -hmm. work pretty well too. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, what, what's your t-shirt size? <laughs> Large. Let's see, okay, well I'll give out t-shirts until I run out and then I'll give people hot sauce. Nice. Nice <laughs> throw.
All right, we'll see if who, how many people I hit with t-shirts today. Uh, more questions? Yeah. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. Uh, I have a question about uh, using multiple uh, multiple devices, multiple drivers in a single test. I'm specifically, I'm talking about a situation where you have the, uh, well, some interaction between two devices, let's say, uh, two Android emulators. And can you uh, open uh, multiple drivers from a single, okay. You okay. can, yeah, we have, um, so the coolest thing I've seen is there's there's a company called Taxi Magic in the states, yeah. and they're using Appium, and um, they have a they have one test with three drivers, one for their website using Selenium, one for uh, Android device, and one for iOS device because they're testing somebody makes a booking uh, using the website, and then the cab driver gets a notification and then they pick them up and then the person pays using their own phone when they leave, so they have this whole test flow. Um, it takes a little bit of setup because you have to create multiple instances of the server on different ports, but if you know about ports, it's easy. Okay. Hopefully you do. Okay, <laughs> and just one question. I think you, you answered it already, but I just want to clarify. Uh, when we used Robotium, we had uh, we had a problem with uh, dynamic generated views. When you uh, it was an Android dev uh, it was uh, Android development, and mm -hmm. when we you've got the view which were uh, dynamically generated and uh, they didn't have any Android IDs, well you were pretty unable to to do anything with it. But I guess that with these uh, with these uh, options to find uh, all these uh, views controls like the XPath uh, XPath uh, option, well you are able to also uh, cope with this kind of content, yes? Yeah, the only, okay. the only limitation is that if you make a custom control that doesn't subclass a standard control, then it's invisible to the UI viewer. So uh, mm -hmm. it's hard to automate that. You have to resort to like, uh, you know, X and Y locations for taps. Oh, but, okay. But yeah, if it's a typical UI element, like a, like an element in a list or something like that, even if it's dynamically generated, you'll still be able to find it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, what's your t-shirt size? Uh, oh. Medium. All right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, hello. About testing on real devices. Um, yeah. Uh, does the app, I, Appium uh, care about you know installing the uh, newest version of the app, or you need to do it man manually, or you need to write in a test some lines to first install, then uninstall? How yeah. it works? So, for real devices, um, well, the nice thing about Android is that real Android devices are not different from emulators, so it works the same on both and. For Android, we can um, install the application for you. We also clean the application state before running each test, so we remove all the user data associated with it, so that every time you launch your application, it's in a clean state. You can also choose to uninstall and reinstall the app for every test to you know, make sure that it's the absolute newest version. For iOS real devices, um, it works best if you have the app already on the device because of the way that it works to deploy applications and because of the whole um, provisioning process for iOS apps, it's the easiest if you just put the app on the device and then you use the bundle ID for the app to, to launch the test. But, uh, is there a way to do it automatically on iOS? There is, yeah, there's a tool called Fruitstrap, um, which tries to install automatically. What we found is that that works for some people, and for some people, it, it just doesn't really work that well. And that's, that's just a limitation in Apple's, uh, I don't know, developer workflow decisions. I don't, know, I don't know why they chose for it to be so difficult, but as soon as we can find a, a nicer way to, to make it work, we definitely want people to be able to take like an IPA file that's correctly signed and have it automatically pushed to the application. Um, but there's also no way to like delete applications from a real device easily. It's a bit more complex with iOS. So anyway, do you want a t-shirt? Uh, what's, what's your size? Uh, big, all right. Uh, all right, this is, this is the, the big one. <laughs> nice. Okay. 
Next uh, question. Mm-hmm. Is the Appium can s- test uh, a games, for example? Uh, games? Yeah. Technically, yes, but in practice, it's not as useful because typically games don't use the standard UI controls. Um, and so it's very hard to get, it's very hard to find an element in a game because unless it's a standard UI element that is provided in the SDK, you can't get a handle on it. So the best you could do would be click these uh, coordinates and then take a screenshot and, and assert that it matches what you expect. Um, but for something like a fast-paced 3D moving game, um, I don't know. I don't think it would be that useful yet. Okay, but one of the things that I'm trying to add soon is find an area by image. So you you pass in like a PNG file or something, and it finds the location on the screen that most closely resembles that using some kind of image recognition. So if you wanted to find like the star in your game, you know, you say find by this thing. And then it finds it and it gives you the location so you can assert that the star is in the right place, for example. So that's the kind of thing that would be more helpful for games, but that doesn't exist quite yet. Thank you. Yep. So I only have, I have small and medium if you want a t-shirt. Medium? medium? Okay. Yeah. All right, look out, guys. <laughs> nice. Uh, hi. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question. Uh, I know everyone can imagine automated tests which can pass or fail, but I'm actually in more interested in automated performance testing. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have any explicit support for this use case? And second question, do you n- have any data how common this is? Uh, well, it's certainly not that common. Um, most people are using Appium for like correctness tests, um, not performance tests. There is nothing that would limit or prohibit you from doing performance tests because Appium is just an automation f- tool. It's not really a testing tool. Like we don't, Appium doesn't have the concept of assertions or anything. You have to put all of those in your language that you test with. Um, so like what, what kind of thing do you have in mind? I'm just asking if you have an ex- explicit support. So the answer is no. no you just yeah. have you just have the generic generic. Mm, yeah. Set of tools. So it's it's a UI automation framework. So it takes the perspective that you're a human being using the application. Um, so we we don't currently have a way to like give back a, like a performance uh, snapshot of a test run. On iOS, we do because Instruments leaves a, a a trace directory with the log of you know memory and and performance during the test. So you could run a test, take that, and then like evaluate it on your own. But we don't have explicit support to give you like performance statistics or things like that after your test run. Okay, thank you. It's nice suggestions for the uh, guys you are you, that you want uh, new hackers on the. Yeah, team. exactly. <laughs> so I only have small shirts, but if you want to come get a hot sauce, feel free to come up at the end. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, Apple lately introduced bots, so they kind of doing some steps into this continuous integration. Yep. But they are few years uh, behind. Yeah, as as always with everything. Yep. But they're supporting right now only uh, unit testing, but uh, I'm seeing that, that in the future they could support automatic as well for the UI. So yep. not, are you not afraid to lose this, this platform? Um, well, I don't think we'll lose the platform. Um, I think if they are intentionally providing better functional testing tools, I view that as a good thing because it shows they care. Yeah, but uh, they, they're not too open to cooperate. Yeah, the, this, They're not, this, yeah. yeah. Um, We'll, we'll always provide whatever support we can with Appium. I mean, the point behind Appium is that you shouldn't be locked into one language or framework. And the way that Apple is going to do it, it's going to lock you into using instruments and to using UI automation, JavaScript, and all that. Um, so we're hoping that people who care about cross-platform will choose to use something like Appium. People who are 
purely iOS developers and they just live in that world, um, maybe it maybe it doesn't make sense for them. Maybe they should just use Apple's tool. I don't know. Okay. Uh, next question, basically my colleague's question, but most of the uh, of the arrows could could show when you upload a new version of the app. So, do you have a mechanism that will install previous version of the app, do some stuff on on this and uh, upgrade the version? leaving the, all the user defaults uh, settings and checking if the app doesn't behave strangely. I see. Uh, not in an automated way. Right now you would have okay. to install the old one, run a test, upgrade, and then rerun the test okay. by hand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's, that's my suggestion. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Interesting case. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one question about like the hardware input. So what happens or how do you see uh, the use of Appium in case where you want where you need a hardware input, say accelerometers, so you know, portrait landscape switches, or yep. if you are doing something with the camera, God forbid network, that sort of things. So. Yeah. Um, a lot of those are supported uh, automation behaviors already. So like changing the orientation, um, not for real devices, of course, but for like the simulator, you can simulate different kinds of things like geolocation you can change, orientation you can change. Um, I don't think they've given us any way to emulate the accelerometer, but hopefully we'll have that in, in a future release of the API. For physical devices, we can't simulate it. That's where things like the robot could come in handy because you could make the robot like shake the device or turn it or something like that. And then you can use Appium to assert that the, you know, the UI has a different orientation, or the the screen looks different according to what you expect. And for example, camera. So if, for example, the user input would depend, say, on what is displayed. So there is it. Yeah. Well, for a real device, you, so you can access the camera um, by using the UI. So if your app has a button that's like take a picture, it clicks it. You know, it will show you whatever the camera sees, whatever the camera sees in reality. You can then click the take picture button and do something with that. Or if you're using the simulator, you can pick a photo from the camera library that was pre-taken, and then you can exp then you can know what the app is supposed to do with that ahead of time. I only have small shirts left, so do you want one? All right. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> all right, I couldn't couldn't get them all. Yeah, <laughs> we're not gonna go let you go home. <laughs> Just a quick one. Um, also, like a bit regarding like the um, performance testing. So the video you showed of the test, mm -hmm. what actually defines like how fast that test is run? Because I mean, like finding two elements and like filling them in and like submitting mm -hmm. should be much faster or could be much faster than what we've seen. So how is like the speed actually defined or like it's it's completely determined by the underlying automation. So um, it happens a lot faster on iOS. For some reason, Android, the underlying library takes longer to simulate those events. OK, um, I didn't add any kind of delay. That's okay. just how Does long that it takes. Make it harder like to test for like whatever load times or let's say um, you submit that form and you want to know okay, how long does it actually take like until well, you can do that. I mean, you can start a timer when you hit the button and then loop until you until some element is visible but in the view. But then that would be very different on those. Well, that's probably determined Well, that's determined by the device. That's not determined by the automation. I thought you were saying, "Hey, it took well, a it long Well, it's like two different things. Yeah. One is like the device and the other one is like the testing. Yeah. But when you're not like filling in a field, once you've hit the button from then until the time when something else shows up, the UI automation isn't altering or affecting the speed at which something loads. Okay. But you could set your emulator to have a certain network speed and test different network speeds that way and you know, assert that, hey, even at this network speed, I want this next view to show up within five seconds or I consider this a failure. You could certainly write that kind of logic. Okay, cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, if there is none, any other question, I've got one. Okay. Which is connected <laughs> to, to the last two ones. I mean, um, 
how experimental are those robots? Is, is it becoming <laughs> a real thing? Uh, yeah, they're selling them. Um, okay. Some people are using them for real. I, I consider it experimental, but um, mm -hmm. some people have started to use it for real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, because well, as we all see, it would uh, it would solve the problems with uh, real hardware, right? Mm -hmm. You you could if if the hardware was there and uh, there was a way for the user to to access it, then there would be a way for a robot to access it. And my other question would be. Uh, would you would you see continuous integration with a robot uh, a totally stupid thing? No, not at all. Uh, I would I would see something like you know um, run your tests on simulators and then like every week run it on real devices and then every month run it on robots or something like that just to like have multiple levels of of, of QA. Mm -hmm. 